is possible for you. So we are all. So I think we are broadcasting. All right. You can see we already have participants joining us. That's great. Welcome, everybody. We're just waiting for a few minutes to let those who are joining us today all get a chance to dial up, dial in, and then we will start. So stay tuned. Maybe I can ask my fellow panelists to mute their mics until we start. Welcome again to those who have just joined in the last few minutes. We're just still giving it a couple of more minutes before we start to make sure everybody has a chance to join us. So stay tuned. All right, so we already have a good number of people who have joined and we're three minutes past the hour. So I would say let's get started and that people who are still joining will have to catch up once they join. Okay, so once again, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar series. Um, this is our second webinar in a series of many webinars, all focusing on our favorite topic, the Minimum Expenditure Basket or MEB. As you know, it's a weekly series. We had our first webinar last week and this is our second one. Uh, the series is put together by the Cash Learning Partnership and co-facilitated with WP. And we have a range of organizations that are joining us in contributing content and presenting as you will see today. So um, my name is Nuna Waring. I work for WFP and our co-facilitator is Natalie Klein of the Cash Learning Partnership. Natalie, maybe you can just wave. <laughs> Hi. Um, so um, let's get started. I just want to remind everybody where, where we're coming from on this. Um, this, as I was just mentioning, is our second webinar in a series. Our first webinar last week focused very much on the MEB fundamentals. So what is an MEB? What is kind of beast is it? How do we use it? How do we compute it? Very much the, the basic stuff. Um, today, we want to look at a very uh, interesting part of how we put this MEB together, which is focusing on um, 
how we can address health needs in the MEB. And in order to help us with that, we have brought in some experts on the subject. Um, so today we will be having a presentation from um, the Global Health Cluster and also from the Gaza Cash Working Group. So with us today, we have uh, Andre Griechspor, uh, Senior Health Policy Advisor from WHO. Uh, and he is joined by uh, Luca Sangali from the Gaza Cash Working Group and Action Against Hunger, and Oliver West, uh, Westerman, who is the cash transfer expert from Mercy Corps. So you will be um, entertained by, <laughs> by these three speakers today. So um, before we get started, just a reminder, um, if you have a question, and I certainly hope that you do, uh, use the Q&A function that you will see uh, in the sidebar of, um, of your Zoom frame to post the question. We're taking note of all the questions throughout the webinar, so you can start posting your questions as soon as you want. And then we will try and address as many of those as we possibly can at the last uh, third of the, of the webinar. For those of you who joined last time, you will remember that we got a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer within the time frame. So what we will do this time around, as we also did last week, is we are taking note of all of your questions and the ones that we aren't managing to answer, we will send out in a QA. and a The Q&A from last week's webinar uh, was uh, sent around a couple of days ago, and we will do the same next week together with the recording of this webinar. All right. So that's a little bit of housekeeping. Before we get into, uh, into the presentations on health needs in the MEB, let's just take one simple step back as we also did last time and remind ourselves, what is the MEB? It's always good to come back to fundamentals before you get into the nitty gritty. So just repeating it again here, the MEB is defined as what a household requires to meet its basic or essential needs on a regular seasonal basis and what it costs. So again, as we also talked at length about last time, we need to then identify what are these basic needs, items and services that can be monetized, price or an expenditure put against it, and that people can actually access through their local markets and local services. And then probably at this point, needless to say, but an MEB is of course a multi-sectoral concept, a multi-sectoral construction. That's all we're going to say on, on the sort of the basics for today. And so I think without further ado, I would like to hand over to Andre, who will take us through um, a recently published health cluster guidance on how to treat health in the MEB. Over to you, Andre. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, I was actually also thinking to start with that one. I just asked uh, Yasmin if she can add the link to the paper as we uploaded it on the, the Health Cluster website. It's a paper that we finalized, uh, I think, two months ago or so, but been working and thinking on for uh, at least uh, over the last year, if not longer, to get our head around this thing. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, th there's been a lot of discussions on, on whether health should be reflected in the MEB, and then if so, uh, what that means and, and how that should be reflected. And there's been some countries where also Ministry of Health said, no, health can't be in the MEB because we provide services for free um, and, and therefore it should not be in an expenditure basket because they should not pay for it. But uh, I think we found in pretty much consistently in all household expenditure surveys that people do have considerable uh, expenditures on health, regardless of the, the, the government's uh, policy on this. And uh, the other argument that we struggled with is that uh, health needs are not, not equal, uh, even within the same household, but between households, uh, people don't have the same amount of illness and the same amount of health needs linked to different illnesses on a, on a regular basis. So some of the concepts behind at a monthly or the seasonal concepts of an MEB, it, it kind of didn't fit very well with uh, the way how we see, uh, how we see health needs uh, panning out. The other thing is that when you look at other sectors, the most of the things that people buy are bought on the market and, and there's a one-on-one -on -one link between what people buy and, and what is being sold on the market uh, in the health sector. Um, 
uh, there's a large extent of government subsidies uh, on services that are available. They, uh, for the public services, they pay the salaries of the health workers, they pay for medicines. Uh, and then uh, also there's a, a mix of different providers. We have um, uh, private for profit, faith-based, they're qualified and non-qualified providers, uh, traditional uh, healers uh, and the MOH run services. So what, what people spend as a as a different uh, different understanding from uh, from some of the other sectors. Uh, next slide. Um, the other thing. Oh, wait, let me just see because I kind of this gets in the way of my own slide. Sorry, I, I look at the wrong side of the screen now. Probably. Um, so. I think the, the bottom line of a long discussion is that we agree that health should be in the MEB. People have uh, health needs uh, and, and they have health expenditures, but we need to interpret it in the, in the right way. Um, we also need to acknowledge that um, uh, there's the cost that people make to get the service or the medication or the, the diagnostic test, but also the money that they spend on transport or cost for the, the, the caretaker. And another big hurdle that we had to overcome is, is then what does the MEB means in terms of transfer value and, and the link with the multi-purpose cash uh, programming. Now, also, I saw from slides that you had in your last session, there's a common understanding, at least on the cash community, that MEB is not equal to MPC. In our health community, that's not always uh, well understood. So uh, I think our paper is kind of explaining what the meaning is of MEB for us and, and how we can help it uh, if we interpret it in the, in the right way. So MEB just confirms that health is a priority need and people have expenditures to it, period. And then uh, I think we need to do further analysis to see where people spend it on what, uh, and then to understand what the best option is to address these expenditures and, and barriers that they are likely to impose. Next one. So this is just a slide. Uh, this, this was a survey done by the emergency response mechanism in uh, Afghanistan. And this was, a, again, a confirmation of, of what you see often that health is, is second or third of the, the priority needs. There's also slides on their expenditure surveys where you see that Health in this case was actually the, the second cause, uh, the, the second ranking in the in the amounts uh, that, that households spend their money on. Uh, next one. And these are things that you see consistently across all countries. So we had uh, basically after long discussions, we ended up with uh, uh, by chance or default or like-minded uh, with the two same methods that uh, I see reflected in the mainstream MEB mechanisms, uh, the rights-based uh, approach and expenditure-based. Um, but we have a third option that in, in the absence of any data, there's, there's a third option. And obviously just like uh, the, the, the MEB for other sectors, uh, you, you usually end up with a mixed approach trying to triangulate different data sources where you have it. Um, and all three methods or, or have disadvantages and risk for underestimation. So um, we need to understand the, the, the limitations and what they represent to interpret them in the right way. Uh, and again, acknowledging that expenditures should change over time. If households spend more than 10% on average, we need to address that. We think that that's undesirable and that services should be more subsidized. So ideally, we would like to see a, a downward trend in direct out-of-pocket expenditures, definitely from if it's above 10% towards below 10%. Um, and then also addressing other barriers. So I'll just walk you quickly through the, the, the two or three methodologies. The um, first one, uh, next slide. <laughs> it's uh, basically a, a costed high priority package. So what we traditionally do, we look at the pattern of disease. Uh, we look at uh, what are the essential priority services that should be available to address them, to reduce excess morbidity and mortality and what, what mix of delivery platforms are the right mix to deliver, community-based, primary care, outreach, uh, mobile teams, referral hospitals. 
and then um, that that such a package of services and their delivery models should then be costed, uh, and that can be translated in an average cost per person per year. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we need to see then how, how did, that that is then what we call total health expenditure. That is a, a sort of a neutral objective estimate of how much it all costs from from top to bottom. But then we need to see what the the funding contribution is from government what the funding contribution is from humanitarian partners, and then the gap between that full costed package uh, minus the government and humanitarian contribution would then in theory be the gap uh, that is left for out of pocket or, or household expenditures, which would then uh, be reflected in the, the MEB. Now the gold standard for this, and I think pretty much everybody on this webinar will know this, it's your insurance premium. That's, that's actually the gap of, of what you and I uh, pay for our health services on a monthly basis. The difference is, is that it's a prepayment. Yeah, it's not a money that you pay to your doctor, it's a monthly amount that you pay to your uh, insurance company. But that is the, the gold standard, uh, if it exists in a country that we would use uh, for a realistic household contribution to the health ex uh, to the overall health expenditures and to get access to a, a high priority package of services now often these even insurance costs and the, the package costed usually don't include indirect costs for transport or uh, uh, for caretakers uh, but they also don't acknowledge that these costed packages only apply to the facilities that are contracted by government or contracted by partners so if people go to a drug vendor on the market that the cost of that are are not included in such a costed package or if they go to a private provider or a traditional dealer um, so some thoughts next slide then the expenditure survey i think similar as uh, as for other sectors it, it gives a, a reflection of what what households currently spend on on their different needs Again, I think the, the average for us is telling something. We would also be very, very much interested to understand what proportion of households spend more than 10% or more than 25% of their total expenditures on health, because we consider these uh, thresholds for uh, catastrophic expenditures when people need to spend more than that amount, than that proportion of their income on health. That means that they, uh, that they compromise on other needs um, or that you often see that people need to take uh, loans or uh, borrow money from, from relatives to pay for, for high cost uh, health expenditures. The other thing is that uh, I think it's not unlike other sectors, the, the fact that poor households often have less expenditures is less, but because they can afford less. And in fact, we expected their um, because illness is often associated with levels of poverty and uh, gives an, a reflection of what they can spend and not what they should spend. Um, again, like I said, if we do these kind of surveys, we would really like to work together with the cash working groups or the partners doing these surveys to add some questions on, on where the expenditures are made, what for, because that will give us a much better grounding for our response option analysis uh, afterwards. And also I make a strong case for adding health related questions in the negative coping questionnaires uh, for a whole lot of reasons, but also as health is often the second or third reason why people spend money. So I think it should be reflected. Uh, really good example of a multi-sectoral negative coping from Afghanistan, by the way. Next slide. So the, the last one is if you don't have any of the previous, uh, but you do have uh, MEB for the other sectors, then we would argue that households uh, in principle should not spend more than 10%, uh, but knowing that they will always spend some, uh, you, you could take an arbitrary or uh, an educated estimate of a proportion of the, the other costed needs of the MEB to add a health component to it. And if we have the feeling or the, the understanding that health partners have not been able to support facilities yet, or th there's low levels of, of subsidizing services, you, you, you lean towards a higher proportion. And if you think that there's already a, a fairly good social protection for health in place, 
you would go for a, a lower proportion. And the moment that you get data from uh, expenditure surveys, PDMs, you can, you can then adjust uh, that proportion. Next slide. So just a few slides. So I have to, where am I? I'm nearly done, I think, no? Uh, yeah. So um, um, I, the whole discussion on what, the, what does it mean that people spend money? Does that automatically mean that, uh, that we then should include a, a similar proportion in the, in the MPC? Are we, that, that's a definite uh, capital no um, in our paper and also in the working paper that we developed with the cluster some years ago. Um, our aim is actually to reduce household expenditures for health. The, we, we, there's a, a large broad consensus that uh, direct expenditures, people having to pay when they're ill, is, is not a good way to finance access to services. It leads to barriers, catastrophic expenditures and negative coping, what have you. So the idea is that we pay the provider uh, and, and allow people access to priority services. Um, so if we see that there are high household expenditures, it means that we're doing something wrong on the supply side. So rather than putting that proportion in the MEC, MPC, our first response should be how can we reduce out-of-pocket payments or how can we reduce the reliance on user fees uh, that are charged by, uh, by clinics. Um, and if we would not do that, if uh, I, I think if we know that we can't do that on short notice, then uh, having some money in the MPC is better than not having that money in the MPC, because we do have evidence that if they do have that money, it, it does allow them to pay for services when they need them. Uh, but if you would continue that, then we would inadvertently contribute to uh, a continuation of fee charging culture for priority services, and that goes really totally against our, uh, our approaches for accessing services when people need it with, uh, with financial protection. Next slide. So I'm not going into the details of this, but uh, this is our response option analysis uh, that, that helps people go through the different uh, problems, barriers uh, in, in the health sector and providing some of the basics uh, of what we can and should do to address certain shortcomings on either capacity, quality, or barriers, including the, the financial ones. So you will see that cash and vouchers are included in this. And, and this is, I think, what we hope to see, that people see sector-specific cash and voucher interventions as something that can complement uh, our other uh, typical interventions and responses. Um, and if we have exhausted all these options, then uh, we should still see how people still have residual out-of-pocket payments and expenditures, and, and then uh, take into account that MPCs can play a, a useful role in, in contributing to facilitating access to, to services, but it's not the starting point. Next slide. Um, yeah, th this is basically saying the same thing, but using the, the diagram that we got from the, the MEB paper set is this gap analysis. Uh, it's basically telling the story for us that if we do find that people have high health expenditures uh, towards 10% or, or 15, 20% as we sometimes see, our first idea is to see if we can uh, reduce these expenditures by subsidizing the services on the provider side. And then actually we, we then should reduce the subsidized expenditures from the MEB. Uh, so, so your gap becomes smaller. It will never become zero for health because it, uh, as many acknowledge, there's always a level of self-medication and expenditures that we can't control. But uh, th this is kind of the way how we negotiate between the, the MEB uh, reducing the expenditure gap uh, but then leaving, being left with a, a small gap, hopefully no more than three, four, five percent that people spend on, on health. And uh, at the end, I think we do need these uh, PDMs or expenditure monitoring surveys to, to get feedback on, on whether we are effective or not in reducing user fees. Uh, I think that was the last slide. 
Yeah, thanks. So Nina, I give the floor back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andre. This was really, really uh, instructive. Um, Natalie has posted the link to the to the guidance note that Andre has been talking about in um, in the chat. I really encourage all of you to take a look. I think it's a really interesting walkthrough of exactly what what Andre has also been talking about. We'll have uh, plenty of time to to get into questions. Just reminding everybody to post your questions uh, now after Gaza has presented their work. Uh, we will uh, we will take some time to to answer your questions. So please don't hold back. This is your chance. Um, and with that, I think I will leave it over to uh, Luca and Oliver to take us through an example of how an MEB was constructed in Gaza and some of the reflections you guys had around both addressing health but also the overall process and why you decided to to review the MEB after a certain amount of time so over to you I'm gonna put up the slide and you just let me know as I should change them thanks a lot thanks a lot Nina and thanks to CARP and WFP for inviting the Gaza Cash Working Group to to present our MEB and the work we have done I'm going to give a a quick presentation and introduction and then and over to my colleague Oliver for a more detailed technical explanation of how the things were done and then I'll have a closure part at the end. Just saying um, we the MEB in Gaza took around six months to be developed. I think this also connects to a discussion that was in the first webinar and it took around six, it took around six months because we basically completely changed the approach we were we were adopting at the beginning, following a number of factors that, that Oliver will be explaining. Uh, we a, a task force was, was set up and uh, uh, all clusters were consulting during the development, including the F cluster. And the, the MEB has been then endorsed also by the ICCG in, in Gaza. So there was kind of a, uh, definitely was a cash working group effort, but, uh, uh, but it was, done in collaboration with the, uh, with the different actors that are here in Gaza, being, as you mentioned before, the MEB, a multi-sectoral uh, kind of concept and, and tool and, um, and thing. The, uh, just briefly, we uh, also, out of this MEB, and we can talk about it later if relevant, we uh, define transfer value for MPCA taking it from, uh, of course, reasoning it from the, from the MEB, I think something that is interesting and, uh, uh, and probably relevant also for uh, future webinars is that the Gaza MEB was done independently, but ended up to be very close to, for example, the national poverty line here in Gaza, in Palestine and, and in Gaza specifically, that was done by the government. And the way we calculated transfer values out of that was also by using the same reasoning and logic of uh, national uh, uh, social protection schemes. So that was also kind of interesting from our side to see that it came out very similar and then we, pushed, we, we went on to, uh, to try aligning, aligning on this. This was just for introduction. I leave the floor to uh, Oliver for a more detailed and technical explanation of how it was done. Thanks, Luca. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to construct the MEB in Gaza, we, we went through two phases. Um, because we were starting from scratch, we initially thought we'd construct uh, a somewhat hybrid MEB using both price and expenditure data. Um, the first step there was identifying the categories or the components of the MEB. Some of these are fairly universal, um, at least from the different baskets that I've seen. So you have food and hygiene items and water, uh, maybe shelter, some NFIs, uh, and possibly health. Um, and we also used uh, a needs assessment conducted by Mercy Corps and CRS um, uh, the, year, the year previously, which had several open-ended questions to identify um, unmet needs uh, effectively. Um, as Luca uh, briefly mentioned, we then met with representatives from different clusters, um, including the health cluster. Firstly, to, to sense check uh, the different NMEB categories we'd identified, then ask what price or expenditure data they had. <clears throat> and it was in meeting with the, the health cluster that informed um, what we'd include in the health category, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. Um, then when we had price, uh, when we had gaps in the price data, we, we decided we will fill those with expenditure data 
uh, collected during um, uh, some short kind of household expenditure surveys conducted by Mercy Corps and WFP and Danish Church Aid. Nin, could we go to the next slide? So it was this um, combination of rights informed price data and expenditure data that uh, that formed the first iteration of the MEB. Um, we presented this to the Cash Working Group in December 2019. Um, and while some parts of the MEB were seen as okay, uh, others were seen as either too, too low, such as food and health, or too high, such as hygiene and household items, um, which were based on standified, dignified hygiene kits and so on. Um, so we then decided to switch to a full expenditure-based MEB because we had uh, quite a lot of data by that point um, from every governorate in the Gaza Strip um, and it was a full expenditure module so we didn't just ask for expenditure um, in the areas that we were missing but we, we did a full module anyway um, and we we combined this this expenditure data with a slightly older uh, national consumption survey which included a more diverse range of households and importantly uh, higher income households too. Um, and when we did this, the health component increased. So in this first iteration, the total for over-the-counter medicines, um, which was what the health cluster recommended we include, nothing more, uh, was around 30 shekels. Um, Nim, could we go to the ne next slide? Thanks. And uh, when we switched to full expenditure, it increased considerably. Uh, to I think around 160, 165 shekels. Um, when we when we asked about how much the households were spending, we did ask about healthcare broadly, including over-the-counter medicines. Um, so this this increased um, considerably, I think, from uh, two or three percent to around 13 percent of the total, uh, which I think is in the next slide. Uh, Nim. Yeah. Um, so at least for health, it was important that we did that. Um, we, going forwards, may shift more to, to a more price-based MEB, um, which, which Luca will talk about, but it's, it may retain some, some expenditure com components too. I'll hand back over to you, Luca. Thanks a lot, Oliver. And just to conclude on, on how on what we want to do with, the, with this MEB, this MEB was finalized in the first half of 2020, 2020, sorry, 2020. And we are now starting the process for a revision. As Oliver was saying, this is an expenditure-based MEB, but we are trying to make it as much as possible a, a rights-based MEB, a price-based MEB. To do that, uh, we came back to cluster coordinators. We agreed with them on sets of uh, of uh, items and we set up a price monitoring system we have a total now of around 157 items that we are monitoring on a, on a monthly basis in collaboration with authorities here and the idea is that using these items further fine-tuning and spe specifying some of them but then using these items to uh, come back to, to update the MEB to a price-based model and uh, um, the, the health expenses that, uh, that we have now in our price monitoring are not only medicines, and this probably connects also to what Andre was saying, are not only medicines. We also, for example, have uh, um, medical materials, uh, the cost of examinations, or we even have like the cost of a, a one day, uh, day hospital with, with a number of checks. So th there are a number of different health related costs that, that are included in the price monitoring that we are doing regularly and that will be used exactly to, to update that. And then out of that, I think the last thing is that we now define the multiple post-cash um, transfer values that of course include health and health component being the health component inside the MEB, but what we would probably be able to do if in, in the future, it will also be to uh, better fine tune multiple post cash transfer values and also try to develop some sectoral specific transfer values uh, for some specific sectors when needed. And, and that again will come when the MEB would probably be um, transferred to a more rights or price based approach. That, that's a bit of the process we, we are going through. Uh, just to give a time frame. again, the, the MEB was finalized around April 2020. 
and uh, uh, we'll start in probably February to the, the, the revision. So it's kind of a 12 month later, kind of a one year later update. Which I think it's finding this the very first time maybe we have in Gaza. There was nothing of this kind before. So we also had time, we also needed time to, to set up all the systems that are needed for, for, the, for the update. And of course, the pandemic hasn't helped on this this year. And I'll hand over and then back to Nuna. And we are here for any question, of course. Excellent. Thank you so much, Oliver and Luca. This was a very, a very nice example and to sort of see your, your, your thought process um that you, i guess you're still sort of on the way to to have it uh, have a full package with the with the um, plan for updating and everything but thank you very much for sharing this um just reminding everybody to post questions we don't have that many yet but that is not going to stop us from starting to ask questions of our panelists and so i would like to direct the first question over to andre and then maybe look and oliver can can complement um so we have a, a couple of of uh, our attendants uh, Isidro and Marian asking about how we're looking like what do we actually mean when we say health expenditures um, so one question here is what happens when our target population or the population that we're interviewing makes uh, use of traditional healers traditional medicines for their health instead of formal services do we include this do we should we include it is one question i would say and then the other thing is how do we make sure that how do we actually capture this and do we capture it differently in our expenditure surveys between traditional medicine and the more formal kind of health um, services that may or may not be available andre do you want to take a, a stab at that question yeah, it's, uh, it, it's one of these things that we obviously also struggled with. We also don't appreciate it when people go to a, a market where they sell fish and rice and there's a little stall selling medicines. And uh, they, they, if people have little money, they give you 10 pills of antibiotics. If you have more money, they give you 20 pills of antibiotics. So there's a lot of quacks and, 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 and undesirable health seeking at least we think undesirable health seeking, particularly if people go to non-qualified providers. I think traditional healers and medicine is a different is a, is a, a different type of category. Yeah, I think there's also a lot of uh, uh, yeah cultural and uh, reasons why why people may go there first. Um, in some countries, we do see that before they come to. Uh, let's say a Western-based type of medicine clinic that they have seen a traditional healer first. Um, but in general, people are, are not stupid. They, they, I think they just like the discussion on alcohol and, and tobacco. I think if people have limited resources, they know how to spend it well. The, the other thing is that the way I look at these, these expenditure surveys, that they simply reflect the reality. This is what people do. Uh, and it's not up to me to tell them whether it's right or wrong. This is what they do. Uh, uh, and, and then I need to find out, is this something that I, I want to subsidize or finance or is it desirable? Uh, what, what do we do with it? Um, now, it, it's a, a bit the same discussion that there's a difference between the design of a, of a multi-purpose cash transfer and what, they, what people use it for. So in that sense, it would be the same for us. I, so. Long story short, if people spend it, we need to know how much they spend. And, and from the surveys, we simply get the confirmation that they spend a certain amount of money. And we would very much like to see more detailed questions to understand where they spend it. So if we do find that traditional medicine takes up a large proportion of where people spend their money, traditional medicine is not for free, as many think. And it's not just a matter of giving a chicken or some rice that you have left over. We need to understand whether that's desirable or whether it's not desirable and whether um, then the, the, the services that we support, are they for free or also have to pay? We sometimes find out that free services, people have to pay under the counter. <laughs> There's a, uh, some corruption going on in some clinics or the, the medicines that NGOs give to the clinics that they support are sold on the market uh, and then people still have to buy their own medicine on. So that there's heaps of things that can go wrong and we only understand what's going on if we understand better 
how much people spend on health, where they spend it on, uh, and on what. And um, yeah, if, if whatever amount of the MEB is translated in a multi-purpose cash uh, transfer, then we still need to see that, that, uh, that it's multi-purpose so they can spend it on anything they want. And if we want to change their behavior, we need to invest in, in behavioral health promotion activities to, to shift them from uh, less going to traditional healers and, and more going to providers that we think are, are, are the ones that we subsidize. All right, excellent. Thank you. I think it's it goes back to a point that we also were talking a bit about in this first webinar we had last week that were more on the fundamentals overall on MEVs, where we tried to make a like a distinguish between what is the analysis and what does your data tell you and how to, what does that mean for translating it into action. And I think as I'm listening to all of you speak, it's becoming to me at least increasingly clear how important this is in particularly in the health sector because more spending and more expenditures does not necessarily mean that you have a higher level of welfare, if you will, that we often assume in other, in other types of spending. The more you can spend up something, the better off you are. But in health, you can correct me if I'm misinterpreting, but in health, it might actually be a sign of something bad happening or the fact that the services that may sh should be provided for you are not actually in place. So I would say here, it's really showcasing how important that distinguish between what is behavior and actual costs facing people telling us what does that translate into in an, in an MB and what does that actually trans what should that then mean for our response but um, enough for me I want to uh, uh, raise a question to our Palestine colleagues uh, so Rosalind is asking um, what components of the health expenditures that you're planning to monitor uh, as part of your MEB, and if you have any insights on the uh, uh, policy on health, on the user fees, health uh, health policy user fees in in Palestine, how that relates? Yeah, um, well, on the on the user policy in Palestine, uh, I mean that would require a webinar on its own. Uh, in terms of Gaza, just briefly, we can say, uh, I would say the more than half of Gaza residents are refugees, so they fall, they fall under UN rule assistance, and it, it does also include some health assistance. There, are, uh, there is the Ministry of Health uh, providing uh, um, basic health care. Uh, some things are for free, but most are, are for minimum prices. It's also true at the same time that I think the last update from the from the health cluster a few weeks ago said like over 40% of the medicines are in public hospital like at 0% at the moment and that's kind of a chronic situation. Um, so th um, there are there is also a very, very, very little number of people who have some sort of uh, health insurance, uh, uh, some also and now the Ministry of Social Development has included it in its plan for future uh, development of social protection schemes but it's, it's still in the way. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated situation in terms of coverage. In terms of what we are monitoring now, we, um, we, have, uh, uh, we reached out to the health cluster. We are still in, in uh, and, and we are basically basing our monitoring on, on their recommendation being uh, not as being uh, health people. Um, the, what we're monitoring now, uh, it includes uh, a bunch of medicines uh, basic medicines. It also has a number of um, medical uh, medical materials, but also uh, kind of tests. For example, the blood test, pregnancy tests, um, cholesterol screening, etc. I'm just reading through our list, and there are also, for example, uh, some uh, costs for like mi minimal surgeries. I pro should pro not probably be here, but kind of being monitored. Uh, overnight uh, with treatment in a public hospital, etc. These items were not randomly chosen. Again, I've, uh, I've been presenting to the to the health cluster and discussion is still ongoing, but have been taken uh, initially by the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, which is the authority in, in um, doing statistics in Palestine for, for pretty much everything. And uh, um, these are also the ones that uh, I'm, I'm uh, um, at least some of them are the ones that then um, 
the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics and the Ministry of Social Development used to develop the poverty line, which, by the way, has been um, has been updated just last month here in Palestine. So I think this also contributed to that. Great, thank you. So um, we're staying a little bit in the same area here of, of expenditures. Now we, we talked a lot about them last time and it, it seems we're, <laughs> we're talking a lot about them again today. Um, so Lena is asking, and I think it would be great to hear both from, from the Gaza folks and from you, Andre, what are the, the biggest mistake in, or mistakes, <laughs> there might be more, in your experience to avoid when you're, when you're adding in health expenditures in a, in a questionnaire, in a, in a household survey? It would maybe we can hear from Andre first, and then uh, we can hear if you have anything to add from from your experiences in in the Gaza surveys. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm not really sure people can make big mistakes, but um, th there's a difference between doing better and and doing the the absolute bare minimum. I, I think. It's always a challenge with household surveys that every sector always wants to have more questions on their sector to understand better the, the dynamics from their particular sector. If you can only do a survey and you can only ask uh, for each sectorally linked expenditure one or two questions, yeah, then you end up with a general question, how much are you spending on health? But you, you do need to rely then on the, the, the interviewer um, that they explain to the households what is then included in these health expenditures. And uh, ministries of health do household health expenditures, but our standard methodology uh, does not include indirect costs. So if you look at the Ministry of Health household health expenditure surveys, they do not include the cost for transport that, that people have to go to a clinic uh, when they go or um, it, they don't include the cost for the caretaker when their child is, uh, is admitted. And I think the household surveys that are done by the cash community have that flexibility. I can't change the Ministry of Health, but I can change the, the way that uh, the cash communities do business. Now, the more sub-questions you can ask in those surveys, the more value the survey has, has for us. Uh, I saw also... Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Burton's uh, case for uh, adding more, more detailed questions. For us, it makes a huge difference to know whether people spend money on a service that we think we provide for free, because that means that there's a level of corruption going on, or there's at least a mismatch between the policy and the, the practice. Uh, we need to know whether they spend it on traditional medicine or whether they buy their medication from a quack on a market. So, uh, and the other thing is it's important to know whether they spend it at primary care level or secondary care level. Um, so the more details we can add to the question, the more feedback and input and foundation it gives to us to see how we can reduce financial barriers to access priority services. In many countries, the, the, the primary care level services are subsidized but then people still have to pay for a C-section or admission to a hospital for their child for complicated malaria. And that can then often be a driver to push households into poverty. So if you take the average, you will, uh, the, the, these expenditures average out over the entire population and they look reasonable. But then if you, um, if you analyze the data that you get, not only calculating the average, but also the proportion of households that had high expenditures. That's the kind of additional analysis that is incredibly helpful for us. Um, so you can argue not asking these questions, yeah, it's, it's not wrong, it's just a limitation of capacities of surveys. Um, and I, I think we're, we're trying to give examples of what a, a standard set of questions would be that would help us understand where people spend it and what they spend it on. And then we can analyze whether that's desirable, whether we want to change their health seeking behavior, whether we want to change to address corruption or whatever we find, we can then take it as a starting point for finding the best solution to, to address the, the finding. Great. I, I wonder, maybe Oliver, do you have any insights from dealing with the nitty gritty of the of the of the Gaza Palestine data to add on to this? 
Um, I would only, I, I agree with, I think everything Andre said then, I would only add, if you have uh, existing data that allows you to break down uh, health expenditures into kind of sub expenditures on medicines, maybe on transport, although in Gaza we had a, a generic transport um, item in the expenditure module, but you know, it could be medicines and transport and overnight stays and things like that. The, the only other thing which, which may be a mistake is, um, is, is not using existing data to uh, effectively make too small an expenditure module. So it's including things other than health. So you get a better understanding of total household expenditure. If your expenditure module tools is too small, uh, you're going to get uh, inaccurate percentages, which is going to lead to an inaccurate MEV. So it's asking, it's making sure you ask not just food and health and shelter, but other things, recreational expenses, other things that the that, that household may spend on. Even if you get very small numbers, it gives you a more accurate total. Great, excellent, Thanks. thank you. Um, so Andre, you mentioned the comment by Joe, and I think it's, it's a very good one. There's not necessarily a question in there, but I thought I would just read it out to the benefit of all. Uh, so Joe says, it's not a question, it's a call to action. There's something important about analyzing expenditure in more detail. Spending on health is not nuanced enough. For example, in Nigeria, we saw people spending on immunizations for under fives which in fact are free in Nigeria. So this expenditure data tells us something important about the functioning of the health system and that needs to be investigated by health colleagues. So I just wanted to, to kind of put that out there because I think it encapsulates a lot of the discussion that we're having around here about one thing is what, what data tells us and the other thing is what it sort of signifies in terms of a broader diagnostic of, of um, services in, in the case of, of the health uh, sector. Um, I wanted to read out a couple of more questions that are going a little bit from, let's say, the construction of the MEV and into how we're using it um, for response. Um, so let me find the questions here. So Isabel asks, if we have any evidence between uh, on the link between multipurpose cash transfers, where this has been explicitly designed to also cover health, and then health-seeking behavior? Um, and uh, Rosalind asked relatedly, um, where was the question? Did it disappear? Um, sorry, I think that was just the question. <laughs> Did, do I have to repeat it? So if we have any evidence on the link between multipurpose cash and health seeking behavior. Okay. Andre, yeah. I think it's over to you. I was waiting for your cue. <laughs> That's the cue. <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, to to start. Okay, now I just moved away from the, the question. Where are you? You took it out. I I think there's still very uh, very few NPCs that uh, explicitly design a proportion for health. Um, and that's also because there's a certain uh, hesitation among the health community to to acknowledge that uh, that there is a, often a gap, uh, as I explained in the presentation, and, and that we that we anticipate this gap and we acknowledge it and we deal with it. Um, I think in general we see that if people if if there is a tradition that people have to spend money for health. We do see generally that uh, that if the MPC is substantive enough uh, to address basic needs, that you then also see that among the ability of households to meet their basic needs, that that includes the ability to seek health services. So in, in general, there is a, a link between increasing amounts of MPC uh, and increasing utilization of health services. Uh, what what the the causal pathway for that is there there are different uh, reasons that can link to that. Um, there's also an approach that we use in the health sector that but that's then a more uh, a sector specific uh, cash intervention uh, the, the the famous conditional cash transfers in in uh, antenatal care for example or linked to uh, other preventive programs like immunization. 
And there we do see that, uh, or, or when we start subsidizing specific services like uh, uh, facility-based deliveries, we do actually see that if you take the, the, if there is a financial barrier, no matter how small, if you take that away, then you see that that for, don't ask me to explain why, but it has effects on other cultural barriers. So in some cultures where uh, women are restricted to seek health services, um, you do see that if you take the financial uh, argument away, that also these women can access services much better than what you would expect on the basis of, the, of, of other non-financial barriers. So, I do think that that cash, be it uh, sector specific or in, in general as a as uh, reducing poverty levels and giving people a meaningful income for meeting their basic needs. I think that that also has an effect on non-financial uh, uh, motives and, and thus have a positive effect in general on health seeking. Now, Again, I, I do not want that this is recorded that Andre Griekspoor from WHO says, Let's push MPC uh, because that will push uh, uh, the, the, the utilization of health services. But this is, uh, I also have to acknowledge the reality, but I still think that there are other ways that we should facilitate uh, uh, access to, to priority services without financial barriers. And I think there's uh, sector specific interventions that we need to address to, 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 to change uh, undesired uh, health seeking uh, and, and promote people to uh, to seek the right services uh, so excellent i think we are almost coming to an end i think we have a few more questions uh, maybe natalie do you want to read out a couple that you were just had at hand Yes, uh, I think there is a very interesting question from Isidro that we can maybe broaden a bit related to how health, uh, how health expenditure changes with age um, as we are having an increasing number of beneficiary households made up of one or two elderly persons where health expenditure is usually much higher than in the average household. So is there any analysis or guidelines as to how health expenditure changes with the age of the household members. And I would be tempted to broaden it to like, how do we, how do we include uh, specific health expenditures of specific demographic groups like pregnant women or, or, or elderly? Uh, is there any guidance and analysis for this? Okay, I assume you asked the question to me, so I'll just won't wait for the queue and, and I'll start talking. Also, I see it's almost three o'clock. I, I think you're mixing up different things. I, I think households that are only consisting of elderly people are definitely more vulnerable. They, they have lower income generating capacity and they have potentially higher expenditures to address certain needs, to, uh, just like households with... Uh, people who are disabled or uh, other factors that increase dependency ratios. So I think from a vulnerability perspective, um, I think it's a factor that needs to be taken into account, just like households that have family members with chronic illnesses or uh, disabilities, as, uh, as I mentioned. Now, the thing is that uh, the, the, the translation into the response is a different thing. Uh, again, the, the, the average uh, expenditures, uh, as, I, as I said in the beginning, is not what interests us primarily. We do realize that uh, that as as you get older, you have more health needs. I'm also uh, so uh, most of the people here in the webinar will have f relatively uh, uh, little health expenditures because you're all working, and the working people are generally more healthy and, and having less expenditure. But your premium is all the same. And there may be people among you who do have chronic illnesses or you may have had cancer already and have had high expenditures. But the thing with the average premium is that you subsidize those who have higher expenditures. We, we subsidize the, the higher health costs for older people or those with chronic illnesses or those who require uh, admission. And to address the, the higher needs of certain groups is exactly by subsidizing the providers 
so that whoever comes, whether you have low utilization needs or high utilization needs, you get the service subsidized when you need it. So there's the, again, there's a difference between the average MEB, the acknowledgement that there are no average health expenditures across individuals within the family and between families, and then the translation into these expenditures into the right approach to uh, share risks, uh, uh, pooling funds and, and purchasing services on behalf of those who, who need the service. So I think your question is good, but you need to uh, translate it in a, in a different way. It doesn't mean that these, these households should have a higher MPC, for example, that that's not the right way. The, the right way is to make sure that these elderly people have no barriers to go to a clinic where they can get the service that they need without paying for it when they have the illness. Excellent. Um, I'm, this is a very engaging discussion. I'm sure we could continue for another hour, but we do have to bring this to a close since we have reached uh, the hour. Um, but I also think this is a very nice note to finish on. Um, I think we've had a really good um, 360 uh, view on both con sort of constructing the MEB around behaviors and what that means, but also what it like the difference between that and then translating that into multi-purpose cash. And I should flag that we do have a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks where we will particularly tackle not just related to health, but more broadly, the issue of setting uh, multi-purpose cash uh, transfer values based on MEBs. So we will sort of pick this, this trail up again um, in a couple of weeks. So I hope you will all come, come back for more. Um, so just as we did last time, we have taken note. I saw a lot of good questions coming in here right in the last few minutes. Unfortunately, we won't have time to address them, but we will take note of all of this and ask our panelists to help us uh, answer those questions for you, as mentioned earlier. Um, and with that, I think we can bring today's session to a close. Um, hopefully, you've all signed up for next week's webinar, which will be on MEBs and how to include energy considerations into the MEB. Natalie will be facilitating this one for us. Um, that's all from me. And then Natalie, do we have any closing words to say? No? No. Nope. The Q&A and recording of the webinar will be shared probably early next week. Great. So with that, thanks everybody for an hour of your time, particularly thanks to Luca, Andre and Oliver for preparing and sharing your experiences. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing everybody back here next week, uh, same time, same channel. Bye everybody.